So hello again, everyone, and welcome to this information visualization lecture that we're having in our course 4DV807. Um, this is like um, a very compressed version of some basic stuff uh, about information visualization. Uh, the lecture is going to start today and then probably finish next week because we have these two slots for, for InfoVis lectures. These are basic stuff and they are compressed, so I'm rushing a little bit. We're not gonna see anything in that much detail, um, but that's, that's the idea right now. So the idea is that we will just give you some very, very basic ideas and you will slowly get more in-depth, more detailed information from the InfoVis courses with it was course with uh, Professor Andreas Karen, and this is actually inspired by his course. Uh, but I, like I said before, I tried to minimize the overlap. And but anyway, let's. I hope that at least you gather some interesting ideas about this, and then you can also go off and on yourself and and do some research and learn some stuff by yourself. Yeah, um, the first, so, so the aim of this lecture is to make sure you understand that data sets come in different types, right? They are, they are categorized in different ways and the data attributes from the data sets when they exist are also, can also be categorized into different conceptual groups and based on their structure and the information they carry and that affects everything else you do when you're uh, doing visualization because then you have different visualizations or visual structures or visual abstractions that are good for different data sets and data attributes and so on. You should be able to recognize the design space of visual mappings currently available for each data set and data attribute type. So again, different data sets, different data attribute types will will require different uh, visual mappings and there is a design space of this that you should be able to recognize and identify the strengths and weaknesses of different visualization techniques because there is no silver bullet, right? Uh, different techniques and different um, abstractions and mappings will be, will have their strengths but they will also have their weaknesses so they won't work all the time. I have a question from Christian. Are the categories subjective or is there a standard? There is kind of, um, I, can't, I can't tell you that there is one standard by this guy who said this and that's written in stone, but there is a very, um, quite, a, quite a clear understanding of this that we are going to see today. The, the one that we're going to see today is by the, the mostly taken from the book by Tamara Munzner. And this is a very recent book. I think it came out, what, like four or five years ago at most, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this, this uh, the author Tamara Munzner is a very, very active researcher in the area. So, so this is really as close to state of the art as we have right now in terms of books. And he's, her category, the way that she describes it is more or less the, the most acceptable way. Of course, there will be different people who will use different terms and talk about them in, in, in slightly different ways. But uh, I would say that this is as close as we have right now. Uh, in terms of a standard. I, it's hard to say it's actually a standard because I mean, what's a standard? But um, yeah, so I, I think you can be safe that the, whatever you're, you're, look, you're seeing in this slides is closer to the state of the art as possible, okay? Now we're starting with the basics. So the basics are really, really the basics. When, whenever you think about data, and this, is, this goes for this course, this goes for, for data mining, this goes for uh, machine learning, for anything, right? And we, you always start, of course, from the data. And the most common type of data set is by far uh, univariate data, right? So it's basically just a sequence of one dimensional numerical, numeric, say, values. So you just 
it's just a bunch of numbers. Uh, we usually say it's, um, it's a set of numbers. What, what's the, um, or a data set or univariate data set. So why, why is it that we refer to it as a set and not like a list, for example, or anything like that? Well, because when you talk about set, you are implicitly you you there is no sequence to that in a way like there is no um there's no specific uh it's, it's not like this one comes before this one and comes after that one right it's just a set of numbers they they are just there like like in a in a bag let's say right um and, and that's the, the case, for example, in this uh, in this example where we have the prices of cars. Actually, these you can think of this as being uh, this this specific one is actually two dimensions, but each of these columns is by itself a uh, univariate data. So the price, for example, is a univariate data set. It's just a bunch of numbers in in a bag, right? Uh, so the classic idea here is you enter the values along one axis and, and then you represent the values somehow as dots or bars or circle segments or something like that. Uh, just a second. And um, this can be used with 1D and 2D visual structures, maybe even 3D, but most of the time it's just 1 or 2D visual structures. So it's, it's interesting now that you start to, you know, have a, a differentiate a little bit. What is the actual data? So the dimensionality, so to speak, of the actual data and the dimensionality, so to speak, of the actual, the visual structures that you're using to represent that data, uh, which are sometimes, or even most of the time, not the same. Okay. So um, for example, plots so 1d plots right i guess this is probably the most common one that you will see especially especially this what what they call this two key box plot which is actually also known as as just a box plot uh, in general right uh, it's a one it's one way to represent a univariate data set a very common way uh, because there is some some um, extra information about it but maybe this plot here on the left hand side is probably the most common one and you just put a bunch of dots in in a certain axis like one axis in this case and then you put the these dots as these small circles at the position where the value would be the value for what you're representing and here you can see how uh, it's really just in a way like a bag of points right they they although the, all, all that that is important about them is the value so they're just here or here or here or whatever, anywhere. It based only on their value. So it doesn't, there is no information here, no extra information here that, that indicates if they were like the first value that was measured or the second value that was measured, uh, you know, whenever the data was gathered um, initially, originally. It doesn't matter, the sequ there is no sequence. I mean, you may say, well, you can order it by, small to large yeah you can but that that's up to you it doesn't matter right the the data itself has no ordering it's just a bag of things uh then of course you can add labels for example to the plot and then you basically what you're doing here is you're adding this this extra information then it to this, to this plot so it's one way of doing this whether it makes sense or not depends on uh what you're doing it's just one way. And then there's the box plot. Uh, and, and I find it very interesting to, to, have, to use this example because you can see how the box plot is, um, it's kind of like a very unique and very, let's say, well, it can be, it can, if, when you learn about it, when you learn how to interpret it, it kind of becomes, uh, second nature to you. I mean, I, I at least I, if you're a statistician, for example, if you're used to to looking at these plots, it kind of become uh, becomes second nature to you, and it's a very very common when you're doing scientific reporting to use box plots to represent one D 
distributions. But you know, if you don't like, if you if you don't learn it, if you don't learn how to interpret it, it can be quite uh, quite opaque, like quite a little bit like a black box. And and that's very interesting when it comes to visualization that sometimes you have to actually learn it. Uh, but for those of you who ha who are not familiar with the box plot, uh, the box plot shows, uh, for example, these. Well, it depends. Could be the uh, the mean or the median, but I, I'm supposing this is the median uh, of the data. Yeah, it could be the median or the mean, depending. And then uh, it also uh, covers here, like what are the the first, the the most. Let's say most of the points are in this. Um, in, in, let's say in general, without going to technical details, most of the points are inside this this uh, square here. Then there is this this whiskers, as, as people call it sometimes, that indicate that there are some points up to this extent and some points down to this other extent here, and uh, then the rest is, are just outliers. So if you see a, a dot like this or here, then you can you know that they are very much like outliers. Uh, they're not really part of the main body of the distribution okay There's something wrong with my mouse it's disappearing yeah okay yeah so basically that's what the uh, box plot means you can see when you see a box, box plot like this you can you can assume that this here is either the mean or the median depends on um, standard, depends on how you define it then it really changes a lot but you can d determine that more you can understand that more or less the let's say the average or the the middle of your distribution is here and then most of the points are in this range and then the rest are either rare or outliers and this is just an alternative representation for this one uh, then you have histograms which are two-dimensional and still this is still a representation of a 1d data set right so that's why i told you that sometimes or even most of the time maybe, um, the dimensionality of the visualization that you're using is different than the dimensionality of your data. So you don't necessarily have to use a 1D plot like this in order to represent um, a 1D data set. So a histogram is a 2D drawing for all, let's say, what is let's say the way that you draw it is is it, it is 2d because there are two axes in a way you have one axis in the bottom for example in this case where you have some price ranges like 10 to 20 20 to 30 and so on and then you have a second axis which is the quantitative variable in the y-axis where you actually put the value of the variable here so you're you kind of decomposed your distribution into two axes, and then you use these two axes to represent the data, and then you get some information about it, right? For example, in this case, the histogram says, well, there are eight data points in the range between 10 and 20. There are seven data points in the range from 20 to 30. There are six data points in the range from 30 to 40, and so on. Uh, and that gives you some information about your data that you couldn't really, I mean, you might be able to extract it here, but the truth is that there's a lot of overlap here. So maybe if a point gets, if a point is really, really on top of the other here, because the prices are very, very similar, then you will, you will not be able to actually notice the fact that you have two points, one on top of the other. So that might kind of misrepresent the distribution for you. So this is uh, a different one. On the other hand, in this uh, specific representation, you don't see the data points themselves, right? You see only like a summary of the distribution and you see only, let's say, a compressed or how can I say? Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a summary of the distribution and you don't see the distribution itself, which you actually see here. So, so you see how there are pros and cons and you might, for example, if you, if you have to choose between these two, well, you might, for example, just use both. That, that is one way, that's one thing that we do in visual analytics. So you, you, get, you take these two things, they both have strengths and weaknesses, pros and cons, and then you say, well, why not use both? And then why not connect them both interactively such that 
if I interact with one, like if I filter one somehow, the other will also be filtered in the same way that I filtered the first one. So that's one way that you can think in terms of visual analytics that you don't have to use just one visualization. When you're doing research on visualization itself, like people who are doing research on histograms, what are the best ways to create histograms and to represent histograms? What are some new ways to represent histograms and so on? These people are focusing on one visualization, right? So there it's a histogram and I'm trying to improve this and I'm trying to, to gather scientific um, evidence of which are the best ways to, to build histograms and so on and so forth. That is visualization research. When it comes to visual analytics, we're kind of like, okay, I have a histogram, I have a 1D plot, both are good. I'm just gonna put them both together, connect them somehow, and let's see if that works in order for me to gather the most possible information from this uh, data set, right? And guys, don't forget that you can ask me questions in the chat and you can also raise your hand uh, if you want to actually ask the question, if you actually want to say something. And by raising your hand, I mean that you ac can actually raise your hand here in, on Zoom, don't forget that. Now, this is an interesting uh, thing now that you have to think is that, for example, okay, I decided that I want to do that. I want to use a histogram. However, that's not really like that's not the end of it. Uh, you may think that a histogram is such a such a straightforward thing that you just I decided to use a histogram and that's it. I don't need to think about anything else. Well, that's that's not really how it works because you there are many ways of many different ways of actually creating a histogram. And during the, and, and I mean a histogram, but I mean actually this is, this, this works the same for every visualization that you're ever gonna use. There are always alternative ways of doing something with that visualization. So you can think of them as parameters in a machine learning uh, component. For example, when you're running a machine learning component, you have to set the parameters, right? In the visualization, it's the same thing, uh, more or less the same because you have also parameters for the visualization itself that change how the visualization, it's still a histogram, for example, and you, you may build many different histograms from the same data, depending on your par parameters or in, uh, uh, let's say, your design choices, as sometimes we, we like to, to call them. You, you make a design choice when you're creating this visualization, even though it's still the same visualization, it ends up being a little bit different, right? So for example, let's say I'm doing, a, in this case, I'm doing a bar chart, right? And a histogram is nothing but a, but a, but a bar chart or a, or, or a kind of a bar chart that is built from a 1D data set, right? It's just a bar chart with ranges. But let's say I'm doing a bar chart like this and um, what's important for me is that people should be able to do a lookup on the name. So it's important to me that it's very easy to find an animal in this bar chart that I built, right? So in that case, what I do is I order the x-axis alphabetically by the name. So capybara, cat, and wombat. Because in, like I said, the most important part for me is that, and now, and now you, of course you have to, you have to like imagine that there are 20 different bars in this bar chart, not only three, of course, because for three it's too easy. But uh, imagine there are 20 or 30 bar chart, bars in this bar chart. Then of course, you will need to somehow make it easy for the user to look for a certain name in this, in this bar chart, if there are 30 different names on it. And one of the ways to do that is that you order the axis alphabetically. And that's, one, that's a design choice that you have to do. Because for example, uh, you could also order it by the value. So in this sense, I'm not, I don't really care about, well, it's not that I don't really care, but I care less about the actual names that are you know, on the bottom. And I'm more interested in somehow showing the data trends to the user. So more or less, more or less the shape of these bars so in this case, I order by the value itself, right? So these are, the, this is one example. And I mean, of course, every visualization that you're ever gonna use will have different parameters and, and different possible 
design choices that you can make. And this is one of the things that we expect you guys to write in your proposal when you are going to write like, what is the visualization that I'm gonna use? Oh, I'm gonna use a histogram. Oh yeah, so what are the design choices and why? So I want you guys to say, okay, we decided that this is gonna be histogram like this and the X axis will be uh, ordered like this because blah, blah, blah. And then there is of course, for example, the colors that you're using. Oh, we're gonna use this color and that color, why? Color theory, I mean, you're not gonna have a whole lecture on color theory, so to speak, but you're gonna have, as far as I could see from, uh, from Andrea's slides next week, you're gonna have a very interesting uh, lecture on colors, how to use colors, which colors uh, can go together or not, and things like that. So that um, will, you will, you will have to come up with your design and then justify your design. Why are you using these colors? Why do they go well together and so on and so forth, okay? Oh yeah, so second way to, to use two dimensions to represent a 1D plot, a pie chart. So obviously you can see how the um, representation itself or the visualization itself is two dimensional because of course it's a circle and it fills a certain area, right? So it's two dimensional, but the data that you're representing is one dimensional because you're just representing basically a bunch of numbers, right? In this case, it's something else that's not the, the same data set as before, but it's just some just a 1D uh, data set here. And, and then you have the quantities. It's like a histogram, right? You have the quantities of, of these things and they're represented in this, in this pie chart. But the pie chart, to be completely honest, is usually not the best way to represent these kinds of data sets. So, one thing that I want you guys to think about is that you may like sometimes a certain visualization, but sometimes it, it might not be the actual better, best visualization. And, and you can think of alternatives, like for example, an actual bar chart, right? So these two visualizations, they represent the same thing. But I mean, of course, how can I say for sure? But in my opinion, at least, it's much easier to compare the bars, for example, in the bar chart than to compare the, the pie, the, the, let's say the slices of the pie. For example, which of these two shades of green is larger than the other? Now, if you really think about it, you may say, well, I think the, light, the lighter green here seems to be larger, a larger slice than the, this other one. But that's not really something that you, it's not, some, it's not obvious, you know? It's not something that's like, yeah, I understand. Uh, I see that this one is larger than the other. It's the same thing for, for example, this, this yellow here with this light blue here. Like, I kind of think that the yellow is a bit larger than this one, but I'm not entirely sure. Suddenly, when you, change it to a bar chart or like in a way like a histogram here because the y-axis are the counts so but it's not really a histogram I guess because we, we have the the different categories here so that's just that's just uh, consider it's a bar simply a bar chart when you change into a bar chart here the the comparison between the bars is immediate right it's absolutely clear that the green one here is larger than the, the, well, both are green, but the lighter green here is, is larger than the one here. And not only that, but I can even see that according to the scale here, it's about roughly 1,000 more than the other one because this one is close to 12,000 and this one is close to 13,000. And we don't see the, the odd numbers here, but it's this one's close to 13,000. So, so not only I know that this one is larger than this one, but I know, it, I know even roughly how much larger. And that's something you cannot see here, period. The other question that I asked before was, you know, was this one larger than this one? It kind of feels like yes, but I'm not entirely sure. 
Well, yes, it is. And actually it's more or less by the same amount as, as these two. So this one is close to 8,000, this, this one is close to 9,000. And I know that this one is larger than this one by roughly 1,000, uh, which, uh, which is much better, right? It's much better than what I could do here. So people will say, well, you know, we use a pie chart when, when there's a hole and each, each uh, data point or each data group kind of fills fields, uh, uh, one part of this hole, then yeah, I mean, I understand. But one of the problems with the pie chart is that it has these, it's a cone, it's like a cone, and, and it closes to the, to the center here. And so it's not really that easy to interpret the size of this complete area of this slice, right? So for example, this, this uh, the, the smallest one here, the, this like yellowish color, it goes so thin all the way to the end that it becomes really, really hard to kind of really have, uh, well, you know, there are, there are scientific studies about this that we can check later, but the, the, just informally, it becomes quite hard to actually interpret like what is the area of this thing, you know? Uh, so usually we say avoid pie charts and use bar charts and only use pie charts if you have a very, very, very clear idea that it it is really 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 much better okay and then you justify that but usually bar charts will work uh, much better and this one is also interesting uh, this is one that is kind of a combination of a pie chart and a bar chart so it's like a radial I forgot the name exactly of this, how it, this visualization is called. You can look in the book, but it's like this radial um, pie chart where the areas of these slices are changed a little bit. And you can, so in that, in that case, you can mostly compare them a little bit better. Like for example, in this case, it's obvious that this one is larger than this one because we see it here. The yellow and the blue green here, kind of like you can kind of see it's still a little bit complicated. The bar, the bar chart is, is better. Uh, but if you look at the radius, radius here, you can see that this is larger than this one. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's one um, alternative, but it's, I mean, I would still say that probably the bar chart is still better. And uh, maybe you will see that during the course that I really like bar charts. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so then, so that's it for, for 1D, uh, for, for this examples of how, it, how, in how many different ways you can represent the simplest possible data sets, which is a 1D data set, right? So, and as you can see, even for a very simple data set that is 1D, you can already have this whole design space of different things you can do with this. When it comes to bivariate data, basically it's a sequence of two dimensional numeric values. So, um, What's the difference between a bivariate or a two-dimensional data set and two independent univariate data sets? That's a question that sometimes comes up. The difference is that these two, well, two independent univariate data sets might have data from different entities, let's say. So one is measured at a, at a certain point in time, the other one was measured at another point in time, and the measurements don't relate to each other, right? When you, when you get bivariate data, we're talking about two, they, it's still two univariate data sets, but they're connected. There is an implicit connection between each point from one data set to each point from the other data set. So you, if you think of it as a table, then you have two columns, and the rules represent a certain object or a certain element, right? So if you have a row and that row has two columns, these two columns, the, the values on these two columns, they represent the same thing. So it's like a, a measurement of a person, the weight and the height, for example. Even though the weight and the height by themselves are univariate data sets, they represent, they, they're connected, so they represent the same thing. Okay, each, each row represents the same thing. The classic idea here is that you enter the values along two axes, uh, at least. 
And then you represent the values as dots or marks, some kind of a dot or some kind of a mark that carries something extra. Uh, and these are either 2D or 3D visual structures. So you will use either 2D, at least 2D or 3D visual structures most of the time. I don't remember any 1D visualization for 2D data. The aim of the visualization of Bivaria data is to recognize correlations between two values. For example, this is the most common task for you to analyze with bivariate data or with visualization of bivariate data. So when you plot bivariate data, usually what you're looking for is to recognize correlation between these two variables. Correlations, let's see, right? And of course, by far the most common one is to use a scatter plot. So what is a scatter plot? And I'm assuming you guys are really, really beginners on this. <laughs> so um, what is a scatter plot? Well, in a scatter plot, you have two axes. So you have, for example, let's use this, this one example. Number of bedrooms in the Y axis and price or, yeah, in price in the X axis. So how do you plot this? Well, take a point, any point like this one, for example, and like I said in the previous slide, what happens with the bivariate data is that you have columns and you have rows and the, the two values in the same row, they represent the same thing, right? So let's consider this thing as being this point here. Then the, you take the first column, for example, and you plot it and you put this in, in a line to the, to the value that it represents. So in this case, for example, is something close to 50K. So let's say like 48K. So it goes all the way over here and it has five bedrooms. So it goes all the way up here. So then I take this, if I, if I see this point in the visualization, then I know, okay, this is a, a house that has five bedrooms and the price is a little bit lower than 50,000 pounds. In this case, it's pounds because probably the author is, well, not the author of the book, but the author of the data sets probably. British. <laughs> so, so this is a house with five bedrooms and a little bit less than 50K. It's the cost of the house. And then you take every row of your table and you do the same. You put the points here for every row. Every row has two values. You put the point where the two values are, let's say, aligned and you end up with a scatter plot. Now, the goal of a scatter plot, this is a, this is a small one. So in this scatter plot, you can actually look at the, at the individual points and then kind of even uh, gather information from individual points because it's small. But the goal, the real goal of the, of the scatter plot is to just look at it as like a picture of the entire data set in terms of the correlations between the x-axis and the y-axis. So for example, in this case, is it, it, it is expected, right? I guess it is expected that the more bedrooms our house has, the more expensive it is, right? So we expect that, it, that, it, there, it, that there exists um, a correlation between these two values such that as the number of bedrooms go up, the price all also goes up and vice versa. It doesn't matter. The, 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 the direction of this relationship doesn't matter. So m more bedrooms should be more expensive. So we expect that. And you, you can kind of see that here because it, it, it's not exact. I mean, correlations are never exact. But if you look at, you have some points here and then it kind of, it kind of has this effect of a stair like thing, a stair here and then here and then here, here, here and so on, right? It kind of has this effect of stair. But there's also this spread, right? So this spread kind of shows you that the correlation exists, but there is a lot of variance in it. So it's not like a super in, incredibly clear correlation, although it does exist. And the, and the interesting thing about it, so, so then you might think, well, you know what? 
why, why do I need to have such a thing in order to see correlations if I could just compute the correlation? Because there is a very clear statistical computation for correlation between two columns of a table or two variables of a data set. So there's a very, very clear, very specific way of computing this and, and that gives me a number like uh, 0 0.85 uh, means that there's a high correlation between these two things. So why do I need the visualization in this case? Well, you need it because the visualization not only tells you that there is a correlation, but also how clear that correlation is and also where are the outliers? So for example, this guy is obviously an outlier. Why is it an outlier? Well, you can see it's a five bedroom house that has a very low value, very low price. It is less than 50K, which is, you know, there are very few houses which are actually less than 50K and they're only one bedroom houses or apartments or something like that. So there's these two, these two points here that are less than 2K and they're both one bedroom houses or apartments. And then all of a sudden you go up there, you have a guy, a, a certain house with five bedrooms and costs less than, than 50K. So these, these things become clear when you look at the scatter plot. And this is something that obviously you would not have in the, the, the final value that you get from a correlation measure. Probably this, this guy here would affect the correlation measure a lot. So just the fact that it exists would push the correlation or pull the correlation down. Um, but, but you don't see that because after you have the final value of the correlation, that becomes a black box. It's like, okay, 0 0.62, that's it. Uh, of course, we know there's, there are other measures of, uh, to, to represent also how, trust, how, you, how much you can trust that correlation or something like that, but the visualization just shows that to you. And it's the same for like this guy here, which is a one bedroom apartment or house, but it's um, around 275 or even more uh, thousand pounds. So that's also an outlier because that's, you know, you don't expect that. So again, the visualization will show you this. It will show you the spread of the correlation around, uh, along the X axis, for example, and so on. These are all things that you see from the visualization that you won't see if you have just a single value of the correlation, right? Uh, and yeah, that's, and you know, also something that you can see from the, from the visualization that you might not see from the, just the final correlation itself is that sometimes the correlation exists and it's very, very clear, but it's not linear. Like for example, in this case, uh, the price, this is, um, diamonds. If I'm not mistaken, I think when you, when you talk about carrots, we're talking about diamonds, that's not gold, right? So uh, I should have put the name here. So, but I'm pretty sure that this is about like jewelry with diamonds. Uh, and of course, the higher the carrot of the diamond, the higher the price, right? Obviously, but this is not a linear increase. What does it mean that it's not a linear increase? It means that if you have a diamond with one carrot and then you take a diamond with two carrots, even though two is double the amount of carrots of the first one, the price increase is not double the first one. It's much more than double because as the carrots increase, the price increases exponentially instead of increasing linearly with the carrots. And then if you take a three carat uh, diamond, actually we don't even see it here because it's like, I, I don't even know what that means. Uh, it, you don't even see that. Then you have some some weird outlier here with a four point one or two carats here. Maybe a error in the data, or maybe it's just some weird diamond that is you know, on the crown of some queen somewhere. Um, but as you can see, we don't even get to three here most of the time. So so because basically it just just shoots up completely, right? Uh, it's um, it, the price grows up too 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 fast uh, as you go from one to two and then two to two point five or something like this. And you might see, okay, if you if I look at the scatter plot and if I if I just let's say if I just took the correlation, I would I would see the 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 correlation for sure that the correlation. I mean, there would be a number and that would be 
actually pretty high uh, correlation anyway. But that would not be the entire story, right? You wouldn't be you you wouldn't be um, seeing the entire story about this data set just by looking at the correlation measure. You would have you have to actually look for the visualization in order to see that the correlation is not linear; it's uh, exponential. And then what what you can do is you can change for example in this case is again this is a design decision that you have to make for the scatter plot that you're building but you can change the the scales of the axis in order to be like a log scale for example and then all of a sudden you have a perfectly linear correlation between these two axes uh, because the scales are different. So the correlation is still linear, but in a different scale. And, and this is very interesting to see how this translates to this, or this translates to this, depending on the axis, the scales of the axis. And make no mistake, these are exactly the same data sets. Okay. It's just that there is a, since there is this, uh, uh, you know, exponential, let's say, relationship between these two, then you have to change the, the scales in order to see them more clearly. And one other thing that you can do as a design decision in your scatter plot is to add other mappings to this. So you can add like colors and areas to these points. So then they, they're not just points anymore. They're not just, just dots that are marking a certain uh, specific coordinate in your scatter plot, but they are also carrying more information about themselves. So for example, in this case, there's the colors here, uh, which indicate which, these are countries. This, this is a scatter plot uh, with two measurements from, from countries in the world. Um, and then the, the color here marks which continent these countries are coming from. And the area is also, and, and then the area is the third value that you're mapping on top of your scatter plot. So in, in this sense, you could even think that, you, you could consider that this scatter plot here is showing four dimensions at the same time and not three anymore, or not two anymore. Two is just X axis and Y axis, but then you add a, a third one in the color, like which continent are you, are you from? And you add a fourth one in the area. And, and in this case, it's, I'm, unfortunately, I forgot to, to take note of this, but it's some kind of a measurement uh, of life quality in these data, in these countries. So like the largest the country, the largest, uh, the life expectancy or, life expectancy is actually in the, in the X axis. Uh, unfortunately, it's too, too small. I need to fix that. But uh, some kind of a measurement related to the quality of life in these countries. So the largest, the better. Uh, and again, these are design decisions that you can make in your scatter plot, but you have to support them because the more information you put in these things, the harder it is to read them. Of course, if you just have X and Y and then points, you can read that very easily. But then as soon as colors come up and size, area, then you have overlap. So one point ends up on top of the other and then you may or may not see something there anymore. Um, so you have to think about what, which colors are you using? How are, are they visible or are they not visible and so on and so forth. So these design decisions are very important. It's not possible in visualization. You can never just go and say, I want to use colors with this. And then poof, you put there some colors and then, yeah, that's it. I put colors in it. It looks good. No, there's always design decisions. Which color map are you using? Uh, are our colors actually uh, adequate or appropriate to show whatever information you're trying to show? If yes, why? If yes, why? If not, why not? And so on and so forth. This, so these are all design decisions. Always remember, it is not enough to just cram as much information in your visualization as possible because you cannot just assume that whatever you're putting in your visualization immediately becomes visible or immediately becomes clear to the person who is uh, looking at your visualization because that's not true, okay? Uh, every time you add something to your visualization, a new mapping or a new attribute, you have to think, does this actually convey the information that I'm trying to convey? 
is this actually effective to represent this, this thing that I'm trying to represent? Because it's, if it's not, then you shouldn't do it. Because not only you're not conveying the information that you want to convey, but you're also probably getting in the way of the previous uh, mappings that you already did. So if you, if you have the X and you have the Y and you add something else, not only you might not convey the information you want to convey with color, but you can also maybe hurt even the information that you're already conveying with the X and Y axis. So these decisions must always be very well thought of and well considered in order to make sure that you don't make it worse than it already is. And so much more, right? These are just some basic things that uh, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, if you go to this, this is one of the like catalogs of visualizations that exist out there. There are quite a few more. But if you go into this, this URL, you will see that you can uh, explore this space of chart types and that each one of them has their own, like, okay, is it 1D, is it 2D, or what's the, what's the goal of this chart, what kind of information this chart is conveying, and so on and so forth. So I really recommend you guys to, to, to check this out. There's, there are a couple more uh, that we could that I could point you to, which are basically the same, but this I think is a one that's very, very interesting. Now, these are like super basic uh, visualization things that I wanted to talk to you about. And now we're actually going to go and start, start looking at this thing that we call the information visualization pipeline. So now it's more like, um, more uh, of a scientific uh, background in, in a way, instead of just what I was in this, this introduction was more like an overall general idea of how to use basic visualization. But um, now we're going to have a little bit more of an academic, so to speak, background to these slides. Uh, and this is the information visualization pipeline as defined many years ago and again i forgot to put the reference here so i'll fix this uh, before i upload the, the slides to you but this comes from a guy called uh, card and uh, Stuart card that he put this in his uh, his book a long time ago and that became kind of like a standard um, but the idea here is very quickly is this the pipeline that goes from having some data to having some visualization what happens in between, right? Well, you start from your source data, which is whatever, uh, whatever data you have extracted, right? From anywhere. Then usually there is, there is a step of transformation in this data where you transform it into data tables. So this is a, because very rarely your data comes perfectly in a table format. Some of the data sets that you're gonna get actually come in table format because that we made it easy for you. But when, you, when you're talking about real life things, the, the data very rarely comes in a table format, right? So they, you have to go through this transformation in order to make it into a table. Then at, when you have well, a table or any kind of structured information, right? So let's consider them data tables, but it, in general, we're just talking about structured data. Then from this structured data, you have visual mappings that will map them into a visual abstraction. Like, like in the previous examples that we were talking about, you're taking some data, some, uh, data from the tables and you're mapping them into a visual abstraction, for example, of a bar, which is a rectangle. So the rectangle here is your visual abstraction for your, for whatever it is in your data table, or you're, you're mapping it into the visual abstraction of a circle, right? A little circle that goes somewhere in this, in this scatter plot may or may not have an area or a color. But what, what matters here is that you're mapping a certain thing that you have on your table, like I have the, let's say I have the column, a certain column, then I map it to the X axis. That's a visual mapping, right? You're mapping a thing from your table into a thing from 
a possible visualization, an axis or uh, a mark or a, a symbol or something like this. So there's this mapping. Then from the mapping, it goes into an actual view. Now you may you may have a little bit of problem to uh, understand the difference between a map, uh, this visual abstraction, and the view. But the but the thing is that it's not just because you have a bar or something that is being represented as a bar in a bar chart. That bar chart itself can be visually shown in many different ways. Uh, like for example, some people like to use these 3D bar charts, which are horrible. But some people like to do that, and then that is one way to to do that, but then you could have another bar chart that's not 3D, but it's showing the same data. It's still a bar chart, but it's not 3D. Or you can have different color maps that you're, so you're, you're translating this visual abstraction into an actual thing that is shown in your screen. That is what we consider here as a view, right? Um, so, so it's interesting to, to consider this, these differences between an a visual abstraction. When I say like a bar chart, I can think of it as a visual abstraction because I, can, I, I know what a bar chart represents conceptually, but that, that same bar chart can be visualized in many different ways, depending on some decisions about how to present it, right? So actually, I think the visual abstraction is much more important than the actual presentation because the presentation can change, but the visual abstraction is usually intrinsically connected to your data. So if you say it's a scatter plot as a visual abstraction, then it's a scatter plot. And then you will show how you want to present that scatter plot, but uh, it's a scatter plot. And that's a visual abstraction. But we'll start with this, uh, the, this initial thing here, the, this initial step here of transforming your source data into the tables. Um, and let's see how far we can go today. We have um, like 22 minutes now, and which is, I guess, not enough. <laughs> but, uh, but I will go as far as we can go, and then the rest will come next week because we have these two slots anyway. And then we see, we see what's, what's interesting. And also, depending on the plans that Andreas has for the next two or three weeks, then I can probably just adapt it a little bit. But we start with this with this part. Um, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, basically, visual structures depend on the type of data, right? So we're talking about right now. We're talking about this this step of transforming your source data, whatever it is, into a data table or whatever it is, which is simply a structured a structured format for your data, right? I got a question from Christian. Um, so, for example, the visual abstraction is the bar plot, and the color scale is the is the view. Uh, yeah, you could think about that. You could think about it that way. Um, you you can think about this just the fact that you want to show some of your columns, or your columns of your table as uh, bars in a bar in a bar plot. Yeah, that's one way. That's that's the abstraction, and the colors scale is the view. But the problem, uh, it's, it's, it is like that, but it's not 100% like that because sometimes the color itself can be a mapping, right? Because if the color itself is connected to a specific column from your data set, then that is actually a mapping. Now, you could, but, but then after that, you could show it with different color mappings. Because it's one, way to it's one thing to say, I'm showing one column of my data as color, okay? That's a mapping. That, that is a visual mapping. That is, that is the transformation from your data table to a visual abstraction. Because you're saying, I'm going to use colors to represent a certain uh, variable. However, just because you're using color don't, doesn't mean that you must use a specific color or a specific color mapping. That will come when you actually create your view because, because you understand how a specific mapping from a column to, to color can be, you, you could generate four, five different visualizations and in all of them you could represent the same data as color 
with five different color mappings. And maybe one of them is better than the others, and then you pick that one and you choose that one. Uh, so is that more or less clear? So we don't, so another question from Christian. So we don't transform the data into a visual abstraction. We use a visual abstraction to transform data into a view. Um, that's a complicated <laughs> question, but uh, you do both, I would say, if I understand what you mean. You, don't, you do transform the data into a visual abstraction. Well, you don't transform, but you, you um, you plan it in a way, let's say you, but you are transforming, so to speak, conceptually at least, a certain variable into color, but you're then using different colors to represent that visual mapping. I don't know if you understand what I mean, but this is in a way, in a way this is kind of conceptual. Like for example, let's go back to this, uh, to this example here. Let's go back to this scatter plot here. Uh, there, are, there are four mappings here visual mappings, okay? Because there are four variables and each variable is connected to a visual mapping. So there is one variable in the x-axis, there is one variable in the y-axis, there is one variable in color, and there is one variable in area. These are the four mappings, okay? Of course, there are, there are uh, lots of parameters that you can use to represent these mappings, like for example, area. Area can be different things. Like for example, you could map the value into the actual area of the circle, or you could map it into the, the diameter of the circle, and then you can draw the circle based on that. Or you could map it into the area, but you could do that um, exponentially. So you don't want to do that linearly because then all, all circles would look more or less the same. So you map that exponentially so that you really get some small circles and some large circles. So these are parameters, so to speak, of your visual mapping, right? Uh, but the visual mapping is, is really like, okay, this variable is mapped into this visual abstraction. And that's why we call them, we call them visual abstractions because it's not really a thing that you see in the screen. It's an abstraction. It's an idea of a thing that will be in the screen. So like area or color or circle or rectangle and things like that. And then you map them later into the view. Of course, this is not like, it's not perfect. It's not, I cannot, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, is that more or less clear? More or less? Christian? Yeah? All right, good. So it's more or less like that. You know, th think of visual abstractions as real, really like abstractions. So a, a color as an abstraction and then later an actual color, okay? But that's these, these steps, all these steps can be done in different ways. Uh, so now we, we're, we're gonna start uh, thinking about this in terms of how to actually get some data that is completely unstructured and then actually put them into different structures that will then later be visualized, right? And that's, that's very important, guys, to, for, us, for us to make this distinction because, um, for example, when you think of graphs or networks, uh, usually, when when you map there is a there is an abstraction of a network and there is the actual network that is drawn on the screen and the truth is that you can you can take your data and then model it as a network but and there are thousands of ways that you could visualize that network maybe in your mind you're looking you you already have that in your mind i know exactly what i want to do with this and i know exactly the visualization of my network and then maybe you feel like that is the only or the best, the absolute best way to visualize that network. But the truth is that that's not how it works. Uh, a visual structure can be visualized in many, many different ways. And maybe there is some way that, the, that you can visualize it better than what you actually think you can, right? So it's really, really important to kind of break these things apart and think of abstractions first and visualizations later, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna Take a look at some of these right now. Uh, so, so let's think about data types, right? Uh, 
these, these five data types are the five data types that Tamara Munzner uh, offers in her book. But uh, we will basically focus on tables, networks, and trees for this course specifically, because they're by far the most common and they are the ones that I guess you guys are going to use in your uh, project. And when it comes to like fields and uh, geometry and things like that, clusters, they are a bit like, you know, things that, I mean, clusters are very common in, when conceptually, but not in terms of uh, actual visual abstractions. You can see them in different ways. You can visualize clusters with, with um, simpler uh, visualizations. But we're, so we're gonna focus on these because they're the most common and probably they were, that's what will cover most of your, or what you're gonna do in, the, uh, in your projects, right? And we start with tables because again, tables are by far the most common, right? So each row is an item, each column is an attribute. I have talked about this already, so I will uh, move ahead a little bit faster because we, we've discussed this already. Uh, every row represents the same uh, element, right? So it's one person, the person has a name, the person has an age, has a shirt size and has a favorite fruit. So it's important always to remember that these columns, they're not independent from each other. They, the, the, the order here has to follow the right order because if, if one of the columns, for example, gets shuffled, then all of a sudden you, you're, you're saying that Amy is 12 years old when she's actually eight years old. So the rows and the columns, this is very, very, very well structured. So it's important to remember this. You cannot just shuffle one of the columns and lose this connection, right? So this is a table. And uh, I'm referring to the columns here as, as attributes, but I can't, you, you will hear me saying also dimensions or features, but they're exactly the same. They're just columns of a table, okay? And this is a cell, uh, but it's, yeah, not really that important right now, but it's basically a cell that's nine and age because it's the row is nine and the column is age, okay? Now, let's, let's think about uh, attribute types. So these, these attributes are all quite different that, uh, to each other, right? Some of them are numerical, some of them are not, and they have these specific types of these attributes which will then affect how you will visualize them later, right? So for example, favorite fruit, that's a categorical or a nominal type. Why? Because I know that an apple is different than a pear and a pear is different than a peach but there is no ordering to them. It's not like an apple comes before a pear and then a pear comes before a peach. It's, they're just different. And they're all in this set of possibilities without any ordering or without any kind of a relationship to each other, right? Uh, so that's why we call them categorical or nominal. Then there is, for example, the shirt size. The shirt size is, already like uh, it's, it's still in a way categorical. You can think of this if, of it still as a categorical data because it's still categories as uh, small, medium, large, for example, but they have an implicit ordering, right? S comes before M and M comes before L. So you know that there is this, this kind of like, they have a relationship between each other that was not there before with uh, pears and, and peaches and stuff like that. So it's categorical with uh, a little bit more because they have this ordering, this implicit ordering. And, uh, and this, this ordering can be ordinal. So in, when it's ordinal, there is, no, there is no arithmetic operations on it. So for example, you cannot say uh, S minus M or something like this because that makes no sense. Or you cannot say, uh, in between S and M because there also does not exist. So there, you cannot operate on them in any way, S plus M or S times M or anything like that. On the other hand, you can have quantitative data which, which supports arithmetic. So for example, age. Age is a quantitative order data because it's, of course, it's ordered, so it's like age eight, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. And you can do some arithmetic operations with this because you know that, for example, 
you can uh, you can sum uh, the ages of two people and say yeah they have together 16 years or something like this uh, whether it makes sense or not in your context but it's still it's it's a number so you can do something some arithmetic operations on them right uh, and then yeah so so this these are these are basically let's say the data types and then there's the visual channels forget about this remember thing here because this comes from another a previous set of slides that i had where i have i was actually mentioning this in the beginning of the class and then i would come back to it and say remember that we talked about it but um but that's because you're going to see something like this in the perception lecture of andreas karen next week uh, and that's that's where I was uh, mentioning this before, uh, but then I removed those lights in order to avoid uh, duplicates, right? And then comes uh, oh man, visual channels. These are all these are all kinds of like visual channels that you could use in order to do a visual mapping. So. Unfortunately, Tamara uses a different term, different terms than that previous uh, pipeline, right? So this would, this could be like visual mappings or visual abstractions, but she calls it visual channels. But it's basically the same thing. It's, it's a mapping that you can use in order to represent a specific attribute, right? And then you can see, for example, here the first column, the left-hand column is appropriate for ordered attributes, which would be like age or shirt size, right? Depending on whether it's a uh, quantitative or not, then the, cha the channels will change a little bit also. But in general, the first column here is appropriate for uh, ordered attributes. And, and the interesting thing is that Tamara even it gives us this this scale of effectiveness because this is based on actual uh, you know a, a gather uh, like a she gathered some some scientific results and experiments on this and comes up comes up with this ordering that says what's closer to the top is most effective is the most effective visual mapping or visual channel for that specific type of attributes. So for example, the most effective visual channel for ordered attributes is a posi position on a common scale. So for example, what does that mean? If I have two different data points and I put them on a scale, which is like a next a next scale or a y scale of a scatter plot or simply the x scale of a 1d plot as we saw before that is the most effective way to visually represent a quantitative or an ordered value because when you put two for example if you put two values on the same scale you can immediately detect which one is larger than the other, right? Now, I want you to think about this because you could do this differently, right? For example, let's take another example here. Let's take area. So 2D size as, as it's called here, or area. You can take the same two points and map them to like a larger rectangle or a smaller rectangle. And you're still seeing the same thing, right? You're still comparing them. You're still seeing this guy or this point is small, is larger than this other point. You're still seeing that. It's the same thing. You've you've mapped. So this is this is interesting, Christian, for you to kind of like maybe it, it's related to your question because you're taking the same attribute like age. And I could map it into a scale. So I could put points on a scale to represent age. And I could do the same thing using rectangles. So I could take three different rectangles and make them like large, larger or, or smaller, depending on the value of the age, eight, nine, 10. Now, 
what it, what this what this slide is saying is that if you do it on a scale that is better than doing it in area even though both of them would work relatively well and the worst pro possible way for you to do this again if you want to to represent one attribute right is to do it using a volume or the 3D size of an object, like a cube, for example, right? And that is why usually it is not recommended to use 3D bar charts. And by 3D bar, char bar charts, I mean a bar chart, just a bar chart that happens to be represented as like 3D blocks. That is not re uh, recommended at all because it has been determined scientifically that when you map values of ordered attributes or quantitative attributes in 3D formats, like, like um, blocks or something, that is the worst possible way to represent um, this, this kind of attribute, okay? And then there are some other things like the length of the 1D size or the length of, a, of this like dash or the symbol or something like this. Uh, you know, there's angles, as weird as it is, but sometimes it works. Uh, and color luminance, color saturation. And this is, this is, I think I'm going to talk about this now, and then we're going to, um, we're going to save the rest for the next, uh, next lecture. But this one with the colors, this is very interesting to, to, to consider. Because you're going to see a lot about colors next week, next Tuesday with Andreas. But, um, but it's very important to think that when you're talking about colors, you're not just talking about colors, period. There are elements of colors that, are, uh, that can be used for different things. And that is really, really interesting. For example, luminance, the luminance of the color. You can map an attribute, not to the color itself, but to the luminance of that color. And uh, also the same thing for the saturation. So for example, in this case, this is very interesting. In this case, the color itself ha is fixed, is the same color, like so to speak, right? It's when it's fully saturated, when it's, when, when it's in its, let's say original form, fully saturated form, it looks like this. So this is kind of like a, something between a red and orange some salmon or something like this reddish color right in, in its fully saturated way uh form or version this is the color so let we we can think of it okay the color itself is fixed but we chose to map the ordered attribute into the saturation of this fixed color so you saturate it based on the value that you want. So for example, let's say you're, you're doing some visualization of some machine learning uh, results, right? And let's say somehow you want to represent that some of these results are more trustworthy. So you trust them better than some other ones or, or, you, or they're higher quality. And some of them are lower quality and some of them are higher quality. So you want, let's say, you know what, I want to make sure that the lower quality results, they, have, they are not as apparent. They, are, they have less of a highlight to them. So you don't pay so much attention to them. But on the other hand, the high quality ones, I want them to be very visible. I want, to be, I want them to highlight very well. Color saturation could be a good way to do that because you take low saturation, for the low quality ones. So they kind of blend with the background. You don't see them very well. And then you change the saturation gradually as the quality goes up. And then the best quality uh, results are highly saturated. So you see them very clearly because they have a very good contrast, contrast with the background, for example. On the other hand, if you look at and I know I know we're we're uh, out of time, guys. But just give me five minutes to finish this this uh, this uh, reasoning. On the other hand, if you consider that 
you have the hue of the color, now you're changing the hue of the colors. So what is hue? Hue is really like, it's hard, it's hard to explain it in any, in any other word, but it's, let's say it's like the, the name of the color. It's a like yellow or red or green or blue. These are like the hues of the colors. And in this sense, you should never, ever, ever use this. And I mean never use this to represent ordered attributes. So you cannot say that yellow is zero, and then red is one, green is two, and blue is three, right? You will never do that because there is no natural connection or there is no natural sequence between these things. There is no natural sequence between yellow being zero, then red being one, and green being two. Like that, that makes no sense. That's just arbitrary some kind of an arbitrary decision that you made in order to, to put these things into this order. But there is no natural ordering to this. So you should never use hue to represent ordered attributes. But you can still use colors as long as you use uh, saturation, for example. And you will see some other uh, color mappings with Andreas that actually work for ordered attributes because they have been scientifically, let's say, uh, shown to be useful for that. But on the other hand, if you're showing categorical attributes, like what we saw before, a pear and a peach and a apple and a durian, then in that sense, you can use hues because, because that's exactly perfect to represent that yellow and red and green are three different values, but they have no relationship to each other. They're just different values. So you could say apple is red, peach is green, and uh, pear is, or peach is yellow and uh, pear is green. Perfect. No problem. Because then you're simply saying they are different and they have no connection to each other. And that is, you know, these kinds of design decisions are the kinds of design decisions that you have to make when you decide to do your visual mapping, right? So you have to decide, for example, say, uh, you will say, my first column, like whatever it is in the first column, is mapped into color saturation. Now, you're not saying it's mapped into color saturation and the color that I'm going to use is salmon or is, I don't know, some kind of a mix between blue and green or something like that. That's not necessarily what you have to do when you're doing the visual mapping. You're, what you're doing is I'm going to use color saturation. And for this other column, I'm going to use area. And for this other column, I'm gonna map it into the position on, an X, on the X scale. And these mappings must make sense. And uh, hopefully, or at least ideally, they should follow this, this scale of effectiveness from uh, Tamara Munzner. So if possible, you should use the most effective channels for uh, the type of attributes that you're going to represent.